Yeah, yeah, we're so glad that you're here, and I am so thrilled that you care enough about the well-being of the people in your community that you would make this trip, that you would make this commitment, and try to become a Blue Zones community. My name is Greg Steelstra. I work for a company called Healthways in Nashville, Tennessee. You'll meet some of my colleagues uh, during the course of the presentation today. And we are working with Wellmark Blue Cross and Blue Shield uh, to help bring the Blue Zones project to Iowa. What am I standing on, you may be wondering. Uh, this is called a walk station. I want to thank uh, Tom Vandervaart of Tallgrass Business Resources here in Cedar Rapids who made uh, this possible along with some of the other furniture you see. This is actually a desk you can have at work. And uh, it makes a point that you're going to hear again and again in our presentation that if you alter an environment, you can change people's behavior because the healthy choice becomes the easy choice. If this were a regular desk, I would not be walking or getting any exercise. But because it gives me that option, I can take advantage of it. And uh, this is just one example of how altering an environment can make the healthy choice the easy choice. Another one is uh, this. It's not an accordion. You cannot play roll out the barrel on it. But you can sit on it. And uh, this is actually the office chair that I have in my office in Nashville, Tennessee. And it changes my environment, which improves my posture. If I sat in a regular chair, I'd slouch, and my chin would come forward to look at the computer screen, and then my back would hurt. But because I have this, I can't slouch. And I don't have to remind myself not to slouch, because slouching would mean falling over. And so this is uh, just another visual example of how changing an environment can alter people's behavior. Initiative. So how many of you actually participated in the Start Somewhere Walk this last Friday? Raise your hand. Very clear that you guys already know what the Healthiest State Initiative seeks to do, which is to create awareness across the state, get all Iowans engaged, because it's, I don't think I have to tell this group that we have an epidemic in front of us. And if we don't do something different, we are going to be in a really bad place in, in really a handful of years. So the Healthiest State Initiative was really intended to say, how can we get a handful of folks to put a plan together endorsed by the governor, but a privately led initiative so that it seeks to perpetuate itself well beyond when, when someone is or is not in office because this is not a partisan issue. This is a, health, this is a health issue, it's a productivity issue, but it's also a longevity issue. So it's important that, that everybody understands that this is not one company's initiative, this is not one person's initiative, this is Iowans. This is for you all to own, and you've already demonstrated that you have. So we're pleased to have you here. The Blue Zones Project was something that we looked at several years ago because we really felt that we had to find something that was different. We've been trying things for many, many years. We all know what we're supposed to do, but somehow it doesn't seem to happen for everybody that we live and work with. And so the Blue Zones Project is really a centerpiece of the healthiest state, and it seeks to transform communities one community at a time. And we're excited about it because we really do think it's different. And for, for some of the faces in this room, I've actually personally spoken with you. And what I've heard you say time and time again is, this is doable. So that's the exciting part about the Blue Zones Project. The question is, how are we going to know if we get there? And so if you followed some of the, the, the pieces that have been put out into the public domain, you probably heard us reference the Wellbeing Index. And this is a 25-year partnership between Gallup and Healthways to do this one-of-a-kind survey that we believe is the gold standard of measuring well-being. And it's a the couple things to note about this is it measures more than just physical health. It measures social, emotional, and physical health. And it's comprehensive as it looks at people because we all know that just because we might have physical challenges, or maybe we don't, we might have emotional challenges, or maybe we feel lonely. So we know that holistically we have to look at the total well-being of Iowans. So we found this survey and it's been endorsed by some of the key folks that were on the Healthiest State Advisory Team that continue through this endeavor. And they're experts, so the likes of Adeen Sue Curry from the University of, of Iowa, the College of Public Health, Dr. Marionette Miller-Meeks, our Director of Public Health, um, Dr. Raynard Kington from Grinnell College, and Elliot Smith from the Business Council. They looked at this and said, this is the right measure for our progress. Now, as we get to where we stand as a state, currently the Well-Being Index ranks Iowa as 19th in the nation. So number one is it's a tall order, but here's the beauty of this index. It is really very actionable, so the measures don't lag, and what we know is there's the two biggest opportunities for Iowans is the work environment 
and the health behaviors. If we can really focus on those two things, we absolutely have a shot to make Iowa the healthiest state. Cheaper, instead of widening road, to simply fix sidewalks, repaint the street for bike lanes, it's far less expensive investment in many cases. So making the right decision, we need to support our elected officials, and this initiative gets people thinking that way. Last but not least, how many of you think about a place that you're going to go tomorrow from your home or from your office, some, some meeting or thing you have to go to? You have that idea of where you're going tomorrow on that little trip? How long, how many of you can accurately project how long it'll take you to walk there? Raise your hand. If you know exactly how long it takes to walk there. Yeah, so like maybe 5% of this group. We as a society don't even know how long it takes to walk places anymore, so we default to the car. What's interesting, we in these teams say, make sure you walk to the library. Make sure you walk to places of workshop. Make sure you walk to restaurants. Make sure you walk to those typical destinations. So they have a perception in their head. They change the internal environment of how they perceive their world so that walking now is even an option. Because most of you wouldn't even think of walking because it's just it's too remote an idea. So we try to change those perceptions, which then reinforces the social networks making it okay to walk. So one simple walking typical exercise program suddenly is about changing social networks, helping change the community, changing individual perceptions. And I could tell you more stories, but that's enough for now. It is important to do stuff, to get things built. Some of our communities were built um, in a way that makes it unsafe for our seniors to walk when they lose their driving privileges, just like it's unsafe for our kids to walk. We need to think about this seriously in an aging America. And this is a tough thing sometimes in this economy, but we saw and we continue to see that communities that put the right policies in place become more competitive to win grades, grants from the state and federal level. And so, very concretely, no pun intended, come on people, <laughs> gee, wow, make you all stand up and sit down a few more times. Uh, you know, in Albert Lee, they simply changed their policies so when the State Department of Transportation came in to do some road projects, it required the state to put the sidewalks in to connect to the YMCA on the edge of town so now kids have a safe way to get to the Y. By but only possible because they changed their policies. So how does the work get done? Um, one of our core beliefs is that this isn't about us, it's about you and your community choosing to change. And so what you're gonna hear me talk about about 10 times in the next two minutes is training. When we come into the community, one of the first things we do is work with the Gallup Healthways Wellbeing Index to get a baseline data of how well, how is the well-being of the community so that we can measure it every year thereafter and see the improvement. So then we work with you and your community leaders who have identified to run these various initiatives and we train them. We start training them from the very beginning. How do you plan these initiatives? How do you coordinate them? Because our goal is to transform the environment of leadership in your community so that, they, that you have the ability to continue this work. So we begin engaging and training leaders. Then together we do a community assessment and audit and then together we write the blueprint or the plan for how you're going to do this work. So from day one, we start working together doing this transformational work. Then we do it. We get out there. We start running these various initiatives. And the transformation time, as you see listed, as, is, is 18 to 36 months. And I want to explain why the variance. In some of your communities, the Chamber of Commerce, for example, represents 80% of the employers. In other communities, they may represent only 15% of the employers. So in the community where the chamber knows or works with 80%, they can, in one night, get a lot of word out. Where they only represent 15, now we might have to spend a month or two getting the word out. That's a level of complexity that we understand during the blueprint process. And as a result, we plan the schedule accordingly. Last but not least, sustainability. We begin training. We do the planning. And then as we come to the end of our time working in the community day to day, you need to be able to sustain it. So again, we work together to put together a sustainability plan and the training to support that work. For you to succeed, you need to have people who can do the work, as well as the people that we will hire locally. So we need your advisors, your town leaders, to advise us all the way along the way as part of an advisory board. We need people who are passionate about each initiative, whether it's schools or city policy or restaurants or employers, to raise their hand as volunteers and say, we're going to help do the transformation with these. Uh, organizations working on this issue. 
That's the leadership team, those co-chairs. An initiative organizer. We need someone who's effectively a staff person embedded with us that we're training to help be your staff person potentially long term. The way we, we accomplish this in Albert Lee, a uh, small town, is the school district gave part of the time of one person, the city dedicated part of the time of one person, the chamber dedicated part of the time of one person, and as a result, we had a number of people trained on how to run various initiatives. The volunteer coordinator, we use a lot of volunteers. And uh, anybody here a volunteer coordinator? Great, a couple people. It's a special skill set, so we want to make sure that the volunteer coordinators are really well equipped on inspiring and nurturing and training volunteers on all these initiatives. Administrative assistant, you know, it's really, most of us like the big fun stuff, the planning, the strategy, etc. But at the end of the day, an event like this requires a lot of details. And too often we don't spend time thinking through the details. And so one of our goals is to ask you to make sure that someone serves in that administrative role so they understand all the details, so that we don't leave you with a plan that you can't execute. So we really think it at all those levels. And then last, we need a place to hang out work. That's why the office space is up there. We're not rag bri, so we don't need showers. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> so the demonstration, what are we going to invest? What are we pouring into your community? Well, we are going to train a lot of your community members on how to effectively create change. Secondly, we're going to hire a local staff in the community um, that will work with us, for us, and will be the day-to-day -day operation leaders on this work. We work with a lot of national experts to grab their knowledge, put it into tools that can be used in the community, and we make that available. We have a proven approach that we're, we have implemented, we are implementing, um, and that's helpful so that people get a sense of this is working elsewhere. Um, we have a plan. We really do try to improve existing efforts, so where we see your work that's great, that aligns with our mission of changing environments, We'll figure out how to work really well together. And if you're doing work that doesn't align, but it's great work, we'll say, keep doing it, shine a bright line on it, encourage people to participate. And then, you know, community building experience. I think I'd just say that instead of my words, Lois, um, the newly retired uh, public health director for Freeborn County of Albert Lee, said, you know, we were able to get more done in 10 months than she could imagine in 10 years because we pulled the community together to transform Albert Lee in a way that they had never seen before. In closing, you know, one of the things that we have is this little mantra that we remind ourselves, which is real change requires real change. Real change requires real change. You didn't show up today to hear a conversation or participate in a conversation about thinking about big ideas or planning. I think you're here because you want to see things change in your community. So understand that our goal is to come in, work fast, work hard, and to create change that is inspiring and transforming for you as an individual, for your family, and for your community as a whole. And we hope you'll join us on this journey. So I've learned there are places where people live longer. We've learned that we can make your community one of those places. You're probably saying to yourself, if only there were an application process with some forms we could fill out. <laughs> well, good news, there is. And here to tell you about those forms and those deadlines is uh, my friend and colleague from Helpways, Justin Smith. Thanks, Greg. You made, that, you made that sound so exciting. It is. Yeah. Well, real quick, I'm going to make this easy. Everything, almost everything, you need to know about applying is on the back of your brochure. It outlines a, uh, a five-step process that we have, and I'll go through it briefly and just highlight a couple of things as, uh, that you might need to know. So you can see the five-step process here. Uh, it starts with a, submitting a statement of interest. Uh, we then ask uh, some of the communities for applications. We then select a handful of finalists with the idea that uh, we then go and visit those finalists, um, eight to ten, sort of in the first round. And by May 1st, we'll pick, I'll say, three to four cities. We aren't going to pick all ten in the first round. We want to start with a handful, and then, um, and then we'll go to the next round. How many people have registered online? <laughs> Awesome. If you haven't, if you didn't raise your hand, you can go to the, the website www.bluezonesproject.com to do that. There's also a uh, texting vehicle. I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, we've been asked in a few cities um, about, well, what if I don't have a texting cell phone? What if I don't have access to internet? Two options. 
One is most public libraries do have internet access. There's a way to get people to, to do that. Um, that would be one option. Second option is when you submit your statement of interest or application to provide a list of those people who were not able to do it online. We do not have a, a write-in feature at this point. Okay, as I noted, um, statement of interest. Um, how many people have seen the statement of interest? If you have, raise your hand. Wow, a lot of people. So you know what it is. It's, it's, not, it's not a detailed document, but it gives us a sense of your community size, government structure, um, key, key information, as well as the support of the, uh, the leadership who's behind the application. So that is due on the 28th of October. We are then going to identify from that list by November 23rd um, the candidates that we would like to go ahead and submit applications. Um, so they will be notified at that point. Um, those applications are due January 4th. And I know that sounds like a, a long ways off, but it's really not. Um, the good news is it's only 20 questions. Um, and um, it's, uh, it, it also requires some level of uh, statement of support from your community leaders. So again, we can see who's behind it and who's supporting it. Um, I forgot to say one thing, which is uh, the question of who can submit a statement of interest. The answer is anyone can submit a statement of interest, anyone from the community. However, when we get to the application phase, we're going to, if we see five applications from Charles City, we're going to say, hey, guys, can you guys get together and submit one application? That way we know everybody's unified behind one cause and everybody's connected. Okay, um, we'll be visibly visiting the, the finalist communities after selecting them. Selection will happen early February, about February 10th. And then we'll go out and have uh, a day long or maybe multiple day visit with uh, the communities that uh, are finalists. We'll get to know you better, you'll get to know us better, and we'll look at uh, a variety of different factors. Okay, so criteria. People ask, what are the criteria? How are you going to decide how to pick these these 10 shining example communities for the rest of Iowa. We are trying to create a movement, community by community, city by city, across Iowa, so that we can help make Iowa the healthiest state. And to do that, we've got to, we need to have 10 cities that can truly be examples for other communities. That means they need to look like other Iowa communities. That means um, we need a mixture of small, medium, large, from different parts of the state that other communities can look at and said, gosh, if they can do it, we can do it too. So, a couple things. Um, starting with municipal structure. Um, we are, the ideal community is one that has a single mayor, single city council, single school board. Um, and the reason for that is because as you combine communities or multiple communities, you start to get into different uh, decision making, um, it, sometimes it, it's difficult to align agendas across multiple communities. So the ideal case is to have a single municipality. However, if you can show that you can coordinate and you can get together and make a decision as one community with multiple groups, that's okay too. So there's no hard and fast requirement, but this is one thing that we will be taking into account. Local residency number of people who live and work in the same community. This is important from the perspective of are people really invested in that community that, that work there and live there, or are they driving there just for, to work and then going home to somewhere else? Ideal community would have majority of people that live and work in that same community. And these are things that we will be able to kind of look at uh, during the statement of interest process. Uh, stakeholder commitment. Again, uh, Joel and Dan both talked about the fact that we need the leadership of the community behind this. We need to make sure not only mayor, city council, school board, employers, um, public health, all the sort of key people in your community that can help make this successful, we're looking to make sure they're in line and supporting this. Um, media and communications. Um, we really want to make sure that we have the newspapers, television, if there is television, radio, if there's radio, behind this uh, thing, not just to cover it, but to actually support it. Helping to get the word out, helping to recruit volunteers, helping to 
become uh, a part of this effort uh, as, it, as it rolls out. Um, the last thing is something I think you're familiar with, which is the percentage of citizens who show their support. Um, this has generated a little bit of confusion in other places we've been, so I will comment on this. So um, there are two ways to do it. You go to the bluezonesproject.com website, or from your cell phone, you can text BZP to 772937. This is not the same pledge as the Healthy Estate site. Um, there is a pledge and a sign up at the Healthy Estate site. You can link directly from that to the Blue Zones Project to pledge, but it's not the same thing. So we ask that if you've pledged at the Healthy Estate site, take another look and, and, and go to the Blue Zones Project site, and there's an opportunity to show support. <laughs>